just talking to people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's conversations, you know, and I'm good at that. You know, I have a natural gift from God to be able to communicate with people and relate to people. Um, and I learned so much from talking to people. The best thing that I ever learned in life is if you listen more than you speak, I'm you'll always be able to understand so somebody. And one thing that I learned is go, go get it. that we are much no more alike than we are different. It makes belly. that more complicated. On the steps, no Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Live Your Purpose podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan, Jr., um, and it feels so good um, to be back here on the podcast today. Um, those who have been following me, been checking in on me, you know, it's been a lot going on for me the last few months. Um, but this place is similar to my sanctuary, man. So I'm I'm glad to be back on the podcast, having good conversations, um, being able to highlight and share stories of people who I respect um, and people who, you know, I, I want you guys to get a chance to know as well. So, um, before we even get into introducing who we have, I want to say thank you to all of the supporters, you know, everybody who's been su supporting the podcast, um, the audio on, on the audio platforms is available on Spotify, Anchor, as well as Apple Podcasts, everybody who's been supporting the YouTube videos, please subscribe and like um, to the YouTube channel, the Live Your Purpose Podcast YouTube channel, um, everybody who's been supporting the, the merch. Um, the merch has been doing very well, the hoodies, the t-shirts, and, you know, thank you to everybody who's been supporting. It's been a lot of good, organic, and, and solid, and genuine love, so I, I really appreciate y'all. I don't take none of that for granted, um, so so thank you to everybody who's been doing that, you know. Um, so, and, and for those individuals who do not know, this is your first time checking out the podcast, here at the Lead Your Purpose podcast, man, we want to we wanna really be able to highlight Black entrepreneurs, you know, that's that's what we're here for. We are here to have organic, authentic, um, and honest conversations about individuals, you know, to be able to highlight their stories and their backstories and, and talk about their business. Um, but we also want to be able to empower uh, individuals. We want to be able to educate and motivate other individuals as well. Um, and it's always about uplifting the consciousness of people. Um, and without further ado, we definitely have to empower our Black women so, you know, we're going to go ahead and introduce who we got on the on, on the uh, podcast with us today. We have none other than Miss Ebony Allison. She is an entrepreneur, the director of content operations for Blue Life Media, the editor-in-chief of Bombshell Blue, and she is also a youth advocate. Ebony, what's up with you? John, what's up with you? I'm doing, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm blessed. Good. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And, uh... Yeah, thank you again for having me on your podcast today. And again, like, just before we get into anything, like, shout out to you. Congratulations to you. Like, as an entrepreneur, I know how hard it is to start anything and to actually stick with it and to see it grow. So, like, shout out to you for starting something, for having a vision, starting it, and just seeing it through. But thank, thank you for thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah. So we we gonna we gonna dig into your business just a, just a little bit, just 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 a little bit. Um. So so thank thank you for coming. Um. I, I really appreciate it. I know y'all gonna enjoy this enjoy enjoy this episode. Um. So Ebony, I'm, I'm gonna I wanna start at the beginning. Um. You're originally from here, from from Akron. Yeah. Um, and just hearing a little bit about your story, you've been over you've been kind of just traveling a little bit but like tell me a little bit about what was life like for young ebony you know here in the city of akron growing up what were some of your earliest childhood memories when you think about your childhood what do you kind of like revert back to like damn that was a that was a great time um oh my god i mean like so many things so like you mentioned yeah i'm i'm from akron but i have lived in like a lot of other places but born and raised and majority of my life was spent in Akron, Ohio. But growing up, like, I was like an artsy ass kid, right? So like, who I am today is like literally who I've always been. But when I was like a kid and growing up in Akron, it almost wasn't like cool. Like, shout out to people who've made it cool to be a creative now. But like, I was myself at a time when like, being creative was like, oh, you a little different. Right. So, um, so yeah, like, artsy as fuck um i was always into things like i was into sports i was into music like i was in band like i played the drum set i played instruments so very a very creative like childhood 
Um, but one thing that I will say about my childhood is like, and I think that this is kind of like the underlying condition for a lot of kids that grow up in Akron, Ohio is like the, the trauma from it. So even though like there were a lot of silver linings in my childhood, it was a lot of like trauma. Like, you know, like my mom went to prison. My mom was in prison for like the majority of my childhood. My dad was a musician. So he was around, but not like around like he should be. So it was like me, my grandma, uh, my brother was off into the streets living that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but, but my grandma always made sure that I like still had like the best of things, even though it was really hard for her, she disguised it. Like I didn't know that we were poor mm -hmm. until I became an adult. Right, like right. so it was like it was like one of those type of things but again like my childhood in Akron and growing up in Akron it was like it was I had a good childhood like yeah. despite the circumstances and the situations with my family and in my life like overall my childhood was great because by the grace of God I was always in a space that watered my creativity so I think that was basically it. Like, I mean, yeah. So when that did, was. When did you When did you realize that, like, what you was experiencing as a kid was defined as trauma? When When did, When did you realize that? Um, I realized that it was. It wasn't until I got older. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't until I got older, and I say this because, like, when you are going through something as a child, you don't understand that that's not normal mm -hmm. until until you're around something and you're like, oh, well, hold on, this ain't how it's going right, down in my household. Right, right, right. Right, and so, like, I think that's what it was. I didn't understand that. Like I said, I didn't even know that we were poor until I got older and realized, like, God damn, like, we were really struggling for real. So mm -hmm. I think it was in my adult years that I realized, like, yo, my childhood was traumatic. Right, right. <laughs> as F, so, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, do. I mean, the, the, the reason I ask that is because 2020 has been a historical year, right? Ooh. Like, speaking from my own experience, like, there has been event after event. Like, the pandemic aside, you know, from the transition of my mother, um, just other people around me transitioning, like, there has been a lot going on. So it has caused me to, like, go really within and, like, go internal to, like, really figure out who I am during, during this time. Like, what do you think that you've learned about yourself spiritually and mentally, you know what I'm saying, in, in, in 2020 specifically? Uh, spirit, like, what have I learned about myself? Yeah. Um, what has, what, has, what, what ha, has the pandemic, if anything, like the pandemic in just a year in general, has it made you take a step back and go within to make you like, you know, really learn some things differently about yourself? Honestly, uh, listen, let me tell you this. Okay, so I have been uh, in New York for seven years now, right? And like in those seven years that I've been in New York, I've probably been away from Akron for like longer than that because I lived in other places like prior to, to being in New York City. But what the pandemic has taught me about my, yo, like silence. So my career has just been hectic. Like I'm busy. I'm in this city. I got to do this. I'm, I got to do this. So the pandemic has caused me to like sit still. Right. And then like me being silent is like allowing me to like address so many like issues just within myself. And one of the things that I did, which is like, I have not been around my family in so long. So like, I think most of my summer was spent in Akron. I was in Akron most of the summer and being able to just like connect with my parents like on a whole different level like digging deep like I think one of the things that I heard my dad say over the summer was like he apologized for not being as present in like my younger years and my dad never in my life heard him apologize for anything so there's just been like Granted, the pandemic has been crazy and it's been a lot of suffering that people have faced from it. But I think me personally, just like spiritually and like healing and like this whole healing thing that people talk about now, the pandemic has allowed me to heal a lot and just get closer 
with my family, closer with my parents, understanding like the trauma that they went through to cause their own brokenness and like for forgiveness is something that has like happened a lot during the pandemic because listen, I'm like the type of person, like if you wrong me, psh, you're dead to me forever. Like it's a wrap, ain't no coming back. But just sitting in silence and being alone has just caused me to like reconnect and connect with people who I just never thought that I would connect with and literally for the greater good of my own personal healing. So that's just one thing that has caused me or helped me through this whole pandemic or what I've learned. That's so, that's so dope. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's really, that's really great to hear. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of like things being in divine order. And thing, no matter no no matter what, like for the most part, the things that happen outside these outside forces, we don't really have too much control over things. You know, we right. can control our actions and our reactions for the most part. Um, and I, I do believe that things happening and taking place that are supposed to happen. Um, so so for me, I, I feel very similar to that. Like you know, what I'm saying I've been able to get closer with people d- during this time. I've been able to like really have a lot of time by myself that I would have never got. You know, my wife and I had my our, our son literally a week and a half before the pandemic broke out. I would have never been able to get this time with a newborn at home if it wouldn't have been for this pandemic. You know what I'm saying? So there there has been so much positivity um, that has happened, you know, in the midst of turmoil. And I do think that that's, like, super important to, like, highlight. So it's it's beautiful to hear you, you know what I'm saying, be able to speak about, listen, you know, I was able to forgive. I was able to get closer to my parents. We was able to work through some things. That's so good to hear. And that's so important for us as as Black millennials to really be able to, like, vocalize. Because, like, I don't know about you, but, like, my parents came up in the 60s and the 70s. Like, them niggas wasn't in no place to be able to be, you know, open about no healing. You know, you know what I'm saying? That just wasn't, that just wasn't normal. You know? I don't know. So it's so good to hear you know, you speak about it, you know, and, and be aware of it. You know what I'm saying? That, that's, that's super, that's super important to do so. Absolutely. No, I like, I absolutely agree with you. And it was like, my dad is like, first of all, he's like nation of Islam. So that's a whole other thing <laughs> in itself. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, so wait, hold on. So dad was a, dad was a musician and he was with the FOI? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I ain't mad at that. It's so very interesting. But like he, so he is not like a, a, a emotion, feelings. Let's talk about how we feel. Let's heal. Like that's not his thing. But I'm so thankful that over like this summer, like he really tapped in with me on that level. And so like, yeah, it was, it was a, it, it's been good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for for me, you know, my father was in, was in the street. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Got caught up in, in in drugs back in the day in the in the 80s and the 90s. You know, got got caught up with a, with a lot of people. Um, uh, but seeing him today, he's been sober the longest he's ever been sober. He was actually my first guest on my podcast, and he spoke a lot about that. But mm-hmm. I know the pandemic specifically has allowed him to like take a step back and really be able to you know look within himself and do some things intentional you know, with myself, with my little brother, my sisters, and it's just beautiful to see, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I think, I, I think that's, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's dope, man. And I think one thing Charlamagne the God always says is like, you know, our generation is going to be the first generation that is able to heal from our parents' trauma. And that's so, so valuable and so important. Man, it's so important. You, 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 you know what I'm saying? So that's, so I, I, I think that's wonderful. Um, but we can, I, I we we can keep going about about this. I can talk about trauma and trauma experiences all all day. I know, same. But I, but I really, I really want to, you know, what I'm saying, be able to highlight, you know, your backstory and you know how you kind of got into being an entrepreneur as well. So, like, talk to me a little bit about just some of your early influences as, as an entrepreneur. Did you, who did you see that you was like, okay, this person is doing something different than the traditional nine to five? I know you said you was RC. So like that automatically to me that makes me think that your mind frame was just different than the majority of other people. So yeah. like, who were some of your earlier influences just from an entrepreneur? Um. Okay. Honestly and truly, my number who I love and it's crazy. And as a little girl though, I'm talking about as a little girl, Diddy. 
Like, I was like so infatuated with Diddy's work ethic, work ethic when I was like a child, like always Diddy. But then like, I was into fashion though. So in that space, it's a lady, her name is Kelly Catrone. She owns a, a PR company called People's Revolution, but she was just somebody who like, I admired so much just because she was like a woman. Granted, she's white. But she was a woman that, like, created a space and, like, in fashion, and she was respected. So I want to say, like, growing up, those were, like, two people who I, who I admired. It was Diddy and, and Kelly Catron, for sure. How'd you, how'd you get turned on to um, Ke- Kelly Catron being, being a white lady? Like, how'd you, how'd you get hip, hip, hip to her? Just your own, your own knowledge, your own just kind of, like, seeking out information? Okay, you remember the show Laguna Beach that came absolutely. on MTV? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so like the spinoff show, I forget what the spinoff show was called, but it was like yeah, when the two, yeah, I don't remember what it was called either, but it was like when the two girls had moved to New York City and they started working for a PR company and it was Kelly Catrone's PR company. So okay. that is when um, I took a, a interest in her. But also, wait a second, like my favorite, number one influence over everything that I do is Phil Knight. Like, okay. all right. so all right. I, I, oh my God, I can't believe I almost forgot that. So like Phil Knight is like number one, but, but yeah. No, no, that's, that's, that's sweet. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that's, that's dope to hear. So was it just like, was it just your, your involvement within sports and just kind of like the Nike apparel? Like what, what about Phil Knight? Like kind of got you just hip to him and just educated on him? Um, okay. So like Nike has always been like my favorite brand right Mm -hmm. and from like how he was signed athletes from when i would see athletes wearing nike and so forth and i'm talking about like young like young me but um reading his story so what actually like the the thing that captivated me the most was like when i actually read phil knight's story nike is like the biggest brand in the world and to think like how like yo he has so many odds that came against him to where like nike almost did not happen and so when i be like i think about his story like damn like every brand came up against him from kids adidas like converse and now he actually owns converse but all of these brands were like coming up against him to like put him out of business and he still prevailed still went on to be the number one brand in the world started nike with like 50 dollars, paid 30 dollars for the logo like his whole story and how he did it was just so captivating to me so that was just one reason why phil knight always like i just always resonated with his story but um but yeah <laughs> no you listen you getting me hit like i didn't i didn't even know all about know all, all that about phil knight you know what i'm saying so you so you get me yeah. hit. I definitely agree with you. Listen, nobody is more powerful than Nike as a brand. The Nike brand is so powerful. Yo, like I tell all aspiring entrepreneurs, like a book that you should read is Shoe Dog, which is Phil Knight's memoir. But it is the, like, it will change your life. Like, it's that type of book. Like, oh my God. Even to like how he signed LeBron, like how that whole situation came about. But yeah, so... Still not yeah, that's, like, dope. That's, that's dope. That, that, that's dope. So you kind of like always knew early on that the traditional nine to five life was not that was not your that was not your thing. That was not my thing because I had a hard time taking direction from people. <laughs> early on, you realize that early, <laughs> early, and I knew I was like, okay, this this ain't gonna work. And so like I think it came down to like either you gonna create your own dream or build somebody else's dream, and I would rather do the sacrifice and create my own. So that's how that whole thing came about. But so I'm so I'm I'm so intrigued by that by that mindset because like I can speak to for me, that is a mentality that I have um adapted to later in life. Like you know what I'm saying? Late, later later within my twenties, um, that I've kind of got hit to for for me being an entrepreneur, I don't know if it seemed too far fetched. Like I, I can't play in sports. So it just was never, for, for me, it was always, listen, you can try to go to school for playing your sport. If you can't play a sport, you go ahead and work at one of these, these auto, automotive industries. You just survive and get out, get out the way. You know, that was my, 
thinking in my trajectory. So to me, it's just so cool and so dope to hear early on people know, listen, I couldn't take, I couldn't take directions from people early on. I knew that I had to build my own. You know, I, I think that's so powerful for young people to, you know what I'm saying, for, for young people to know and hear. So it's, it's, it's beautiful to hear you say that you knew that early on. Oh, you got, go ahead, you go. Yes, it, is, it is good, but let me tell you this. It's, sometimes I think young people need to also understand, like, granted, like, okay, thankful, I'm so thankful to God that I'm in a position now where, like, I wake up and I make money off of doing things that I love, but it was not always like this. Like, I worked for somebody before. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like, young people nowadays have, like, this whole idea in the, their head of like entrepreneurship of being like this like really sexy and appealing thing when the, like the reality of it is like no and also knowing that like man I worked for years for somebody else before I was finally able to like be in a position to sustain myself off of like my passions so like I want young people to know like yes chase your dreams but also like a, you might have to bite the bullet and hustle under somebody else until you are fully there to be able to provide on your own. But yeah. Yeah. so, so I encourage both. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's that's a fact. That, that that's that's a fact. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, entrepreneurship has become romanticized to say the least. Yeah. Um, but there's 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 value in both sides. But I think you and I will both still agree that at the end of the day building your own equity in something is still more, you know, powerful long-term. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with working for somebody in the midst of, you know, building your own, but like having your sights on having your own is still, you know, probably should be the ultimate goal. Absolutely. Now you also was like an intern for, for Ralph Lauren at, or is it, is it Ralph Lauren? Or is it Ralph Lauren? How you pronounce it? Ralph Lauren. <laughs> oh, excuse, excuse, excuse me, my bad. Excuse me, Ralph, Ralph Lauren. Excuse me, you was an intern for Ralph Lauren. Tell yes. Me, tell me a little bit about that experience and like how how that came about. Um. Okay. So my whole college experience. So I started at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, which is in Georgia. Um. But I lost my scholarship first semester. I was wilding, doing that, like. <laughs> what you tripping. do? What you, what you do to lose your scholarship? partying missing classes like it was like i was independent i was free i was on my own i was like i'm out here yeah, but, do it. Um, but yeah i didn't not taking it serious honestly and truly not even appreciating the fact that i got a, a scholarship to like the one of the top art schools mm. in america so anyway so boom first semester lose my scholarship can't afford to pay for the school so I'm like, all right, damn fuck. Um, end up transferring to the Art Institute of Atlanta. So in the midst of me being at AIA, I had a friend, his name was James. He was at AIA, but he ended up leaving to move to Chicago to transfer to the Art Institute in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, but he was the one who connected me. He was like, yo, we got an internship opening here at Ralph Lauren at the flagship store in Chicago. Uh, like, apply for it so I applied had like a couple of interviews and got it and end up moving to Chicago and I was interning and <laughs> that's how that happened so what, what was your what was your experience like as, as an intern did you did it help you build your foundation ultimately of your business did you hate the experience was it was it a lot of grunt work what was your experience um it was a lot of grunt work it was a lot of like so when I was interning in Chicago, but that wasn't like my first internship, but that internship, um, it was a lot of grunt work. It was like, it wasn't nothing fancy at all. I was like somebody flunky, literally mm -hmm. just litter, just getting coffee, filing papers, like that. How long did you do that? Huh? How long did you, did you do that? Um, I was there for like three months. I interned there for like three months, um, but then I started working. So that was the other thing when I had moved to Chicago. So started interning, but then I started actually working and I was like a merchandiser for Ralph Lauren. So with merchandising, I was responsible for creating like the store displays that you see in the store. So like, like yeah, so that's, okay. so that's what I was, yeah. So that's what I was doing. So I was like, went from an intern to doing that. Um, then I started like getting off into like styling heavy in Chicago. So that was like a whole other experience. 
But yeah, so the intern, we, we'll talk about that later, but interning, it was just a lot of like grunt work, nothing glamorous, nothing fancy. I wasn't even involved in any fashion aspects of it at all as an intern. Now, what was your, what was your like plan at, at this time? Did you, did you have a plan where, where you just kind of like, listen, I'm just going with the flow until something kind of like getting me closer to, you know, styling. So like, what, what was your ultimate plan or goal at this point in time? So back then, the only goal that I had was to be in Chicago um, and work in fashion to some capacity. Like, I didn't have the skill set to be a designer because I can't draw to save my life, but I was still a creative. So it was like a couple of avenues. It was either like production, marketing, merchandising, or styling. Like those were the options. And I leaned towards styling just because like I felt like that's just, I just felt like I could do that. Uh, So I started work. So I was like in Chicago, we would like do it was like a lot of stores so chicago is like a cool city mm-hmm. i hate that it gets such a bad rep in the media but like chicago was really dope for real yeah. um but there were like a lot of stores so like we would do like me and my friend james so we like were this stylist duo in chicago and we would like style the mannequins at your store, right? Like little basic stuff. Mind you, we're like 20 years old, okay? Also kids. Y'all, y'all was living though. <laughs> like young as fuck. But um, so if it was like a hip hop artist who was like in Chicago and he was on the rise, like, and he was about to do his like album package, he would hit us up like, y'all need some looks. Got my album package. Do y'all want to do this? It was like very much like that type of thing athletes so like Chicago had like NFL players and like NBA players so it was like a couple like NFL players who we would pull looks for but like nothing like serious like it wasn't nothing too crazy um but that was honestly that was like it like I was like content with just working in fashion in Chicago doing like client wardrobing and living my life in Chicago and I was like New York was never in my plan like (laughs) living in New York City I never in my life thought that I was going to live in New York City so yeah Yeah. now what did you what did you learn during that time what do you think you took from your experience back then that you still kind of like applied today or like served you value today um what did I learn during my time like of working in fashion in Chicago uh damn like I mean minus like of this the whole like professional aspect of it like oh my gosh and understanding like deadlines I think like I was real like just real relaxed real laid back but people were serious about like when they needed something done so understanding like demands people had demands so that was definitely something that I had to adjust to was listening to people's demands. Cause in my head, I'm still like this, like free spirit, chase my dreams. I'm going to be on my own time. I'm 20 years old, like yeah. whatever, whatever you are talking about, like, but no, just understanding like punctuality, me and deadlines. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were like some of the things that I definitely took away from that whole experience. Yeah, yeah, small, small foundation of building things. It sounds like stuff, yeah. stuff, that, stuff that go goes goes a long way. For sure. Like you never, you never gonna not benefit from being on time. Never. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You never gonna not benefit from having something done by a certain deadline. Like that's always gonna serve you better than than not. You know. What oh, I'm saying? So that's, literally. That's, so that's so that's huge in, in in business. Now I know you also did some. You, you mentioned that you did some styling. Uh, for some athletes, entertainers, rappers, and things like that. Um, you did some styling for Nip, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, right? For, for Nipsey Hussle, right? Nipsey, yes. Talk about your experience with, with, with the with the late, great uh, Nip, Nip Hussle, man. Nip, Nip is one of my biggest influences. Um, I, we, when, I've never experienced uh, grief like that from somebody I didn't know. Like, I was really fucked up behind Nip. And I, st- I still am. Yeah, um, and I know you know down down the line people are going to really appreciate 
the spirit that in the giant that we lost in Nip. So like, just talk to me a little bit about like some of your experiences that you that you had and that you remember from work working with Nip. So okay, so let me tell you this: like, rest in peace, Nipsey. And just like you said, like I had never experienced like grief from a celebrity death. Yeah. From oh my god, I would never. I was like sleep. And I woke up and my friend, I had a text from my friend, like, did you hear about Nip? And I seen the news and I'm talking about just like instant devastation. But what I will say, so my time working with him was so briefly, it was one photo shoot. Um, and this was like, right after he had did, dropped his like mixtape where he was selling his mixtapes for like a hundred dollars. Crenshaw. Yes. So this was like that time. This wasn't like marathon nip. This wasn't none of that. This was like very early Nipsey Hustle. But the one thing that I can't say is like, he was just like very soft spoken. I don't want to say soft spoken, but like on set with him, he was like quiet. He didn't have like complaints. He just literally went with the flow. He was really nice, like really nice, really kind. And he actually was somebody who like put me on to the opportunity that I had after working with him. Mm. So again, it was like very brief. It was one photo shoot, um, but it was, he was just so cool, so calm, like no complaints. I was so young. I think at the time, at that time I was like 25 or 26 and I was fresh. Like I was new in the whole fashion world. And this was like a by chance accident because the original stylist who was scheduled to do the shoot couldn't do it. Mm. So it was like, hey, Eb, like, <laughs> I can't do it, but can you? Yeah. And they're like, it's with Nipsey Hussle. And I'm like, oh my God, I know who he is. Yeah. And so um, flew out to LA to do the shoot. But yeah, we didn't have like much interaction. So I don't have like a grand story to tell you. Yeah. But. But yeah, he was just why like. That, why do you think he was so devastated? Why do Why do you Why do you think his his passing really really impacted you like that? Um, number one, because I had like, of course, that personal like interaction with him prior, and I already knew like his spirit was so pure that it was like, damn, like that happened to him. Right. Um, but also it was like the growth and like how much he had accomplished and what he was doing at the, like he was like about to be that person and his life was taken. So I think it was just like, that was just crazy to me. Yeah. Nip, Nip, Nip is going to go down as literally like one of the biggest legends, you know, that the For world sure. has ever seen. Like, like I think that you have to credit Nip, in the whole entrepreneur movement. Like, Man, absolutely. You know I'm saying like, he's one of the people who really sparked a lot of minds, mine, mine included, you know, like the importance of building your own, establishing that equity, you know, and, and, and building something for yourself. And really, I think what his biggest message, now that I continue to like go back and listen to his music, his biggest message was like, listen, when you build stuff for yourself, it ultimately like impacts your self-worth like how you feel about yourself and like you able to help other people because of that man so it's you know mm -hmm. I, I definitely feel you a uh, 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 hundred percent um you know on the, on the fast and the nip so rest in, rest in peace to the late great mm -hmm. nip hustle man you know we, we we definitely not not forgetting you down here brother you absolutely know. not but i, I do want to know like what was your overall experience you know with, within with, within the fashion world is it did did you love it? Like, cause you always you said that you always had aspirations and you know and and the love for for fashion first, you know. But you ultimately kind of like transitioned into media, you know. So like, what was your overall take from the fashion industry? Is it something that you kind of like just happy you went through? Or is it something that you just like, man? It was cool, but I'm much more happier over here. Um, it was cool, but I'm much more happier over here. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> Why? So, okay, so like, again, literally, like, I just wanted to be a stylist for as long as I could remember to the point, like, when I was in Akron, like, I would style my friends, like, I'm pretty sure you know who Willie Harper is. Yeah. Okay, so when we were, like, 
teenagers, like Willie used to always let me dress him. So I always be like, yo, shout out to Willie because he was one of the first people who trusted me to style. Crash this dummy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing about like working in the fashion industry versus like the entertainment industry, first of all, it's two completely different worlds. The fashion industry is like a world of its own. And it is very <sighs> for me. It was something that I thought I wanted until I got it. And then I was like, oh, no, I don't want this for real. Mm. Um, Because it's like a lot of labor. Being a stylist, people think that that shit is like glamorous, but it's not. You have to have, first of all, you got to have contacts. Like a stylist is only as great as their market contacts. And a market contact is like somebody that's connected to a brand that Mm. you need to pull clothes from for Mm. this person. Mm -hmm. So it's like heavy labor intensive and people don't understand that is a lot of hard work like being a stylist the hours are like tedious crazy like any hour of the day like somebody could call you at like 1 30 in the morning about a look for something that they have going on and for me it was like yo like my purpose is not centered in finding clothes for people mm. like granted in the beginning what attracted to me because I feel like it's so many ways of like storytelling because ultimately at the end of the day I'm just a storyteller Mm -hmm. but I felt like fashion was another way to like you know tell stories through clothing but um mm, it wasn't like it didn't end up being what I expected it to be and so that was why like I had to separate from it it was so crazy to the point where like I was working with, so I just remember the my last thing and I knew I was like, okay, yeah, I'm completely done. I'm completely drained. I'm completely fried by this industry. Um, working with Rihanna for the 2016 MTV VMA Awards. So I have been out of fashion since like 2017. But um, it was a 2016 MTV, MTV VMA Awards. I was a part of Rihanna's fashion team for the VMA Awards. And I just remember being like rehearsals, right? Like we had to be at this arena for rehearsals for like an entire week before the performance ever even happened. And I just remember coming to the arena for rehearsals every day. And I was like depressed, like sad. I'm working with like the biggest star in the world and I'm sad. Like I need to make some changes like with my life. So that was definitely like, a moment in my life where I was like, okay, uh, it's okay. You thought you wanted this, like you experienced it. It wasn't what you thought it was going to be. And like, for me, I think I have become so attached to the perks of what came with like being with this lifestyle. Like I had a completely different Instagram than the Instagram that I have now. Everything was like about that lifestyle. Um, And I had like almost like, my whole identity was like wrapped up in that, but I was unhappy. So it was like, yo, I gotta make the separation now or else it's just going, I'm just going to be on a sinking ship. So I will say like my time working at a stylist, I'm thankful for it. I created a lot of great connections with people that have helped me now with like running a whole magazine, but it just wasn't something that was for me. I thought it was, I experienced it. It wasn't moved on from it so yeah yeah what was your like because that, that that had to be hard right you know what i'm saying that had to be like a, a hard you know pill pill to swallow you know yes. here you are worked your way up to something that you really thought that you wanted um you got it you was at pretty much the highest height and then internally you just wasn't feeling it you know i'm, I'm sure there had to be a lot of fear associated with that like that couldn't have been an easy transition to say mm-hmm you know what, fuck this, I'm going to just do this over here. Like, that had to be a a process. And, like, I'm sure that that was, like, very trying on you mentally and and, and spiritually. No, absolutely. Again, like, because I feel like my whole identity had become wrapped up in, like, this title of being, like, the stylist and being associated with these people. And even, like, so one thing that I will say, like, I have great mentors. A lot of people, like, when I do reconnect with like my friends back in Akron they always ask me like 
like, yo, like, how? Like, how was this able? Like, how were you given these opportunities? But I have astounding, like, mentors. Um, but so, like, even with that, like, my mentors got me through that moment of just accepting the fact that something wasn't for me. And that's even something to, like, for entrepreneurs to take away. Understanding, like, not it's not quitting, but it is like giving up, but giving up to move on to something else. Because if that's not for you, like it's okay and just embrace it and just keep it pushing. Never quit, but move on to something different that you do feel that your spirit really aligns with. Yeah, that's that, it's a, um it's a book that I read. Um, it's called The Way of the Superior Man, and it talks about like it, it's okay to like realize that it's, it's okay to have different purposes right yeah. so like when you realize that you have hit the ceiling on one level of purpose find out what your next purpose is and like pivot quickly mm -hmm. like but it's okay to come up to these different transition points um of whatever your purpose is 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 in that moment i think what you just said is like su super 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 valuable so like how did the idea of even like going into media and the editorial like how did that idea even come out um okay so like back back tracing to like a little bit of my story in the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. so when i first moved to new york city i didn't know a single person in new york city literally like on some dollar in a dream type shit mm -hmm. like i'm like fuck it i'm not being fulfilled fully in chicago like this was fun but like i got other shit that i need to do Mind you, like I said, I never in my life thought that I would live in New York City. So like one night I'm like in my apartment in Chicago, I'm like on my knees praying and like something is like New York. And I'm like, what? Mind you, I didn't been to New York. I don't even like New York for real. I'm like, well, I'm not going to New York. But um, so I was like, okay, New York. Hmm, let me think about this. So like I get on Craigslist, right? And I'm on Craigslist and I see somebody like subletting and I don't even understand like the whole living situation in New York City at the time. So I see somebody subletting their apartment and it was the cheapest one that I could find in the city in Harlem and it was for like $1,000. So I'm like, okay, um, this is the cheapest thing that I could find. Let me hit him up, hit him up. He like, yeah, but you need to get it today because it's mm. going to be gone tomorrow. Mm. So I'm like, I don't know who this person is. Send him a thousand dollars for an apartment that I'm not even sure about. Mm -hmm. But mind you, I saw boom, pack up my car. After I sent him the money, I got $700 in my bank. Pack up my car, drive to New York City, give up my lease, whatever literally give up my lease everything i pack up my car move to new york city i'm in new york i don't know anybody i'm trying to figure out like okay i'm here now what the fuck am i really about to do like what am i about to do um one of my friends who i went to school with at the art institute yo so network is so important so one of my friends who i went to the art institute of atlanta with end up being in new york at the same time he like Oh, you moved to New York. You're trying to get into fashion. I know somebody. Let me connect you with this person. Long story short, they end up connecting me to this guy. His name is Devon Johnson, Devon Christopher Johnson. He is like the original founder of Blue Magazine. So, all right. So they connect me with Devon. Devon was the head of marketing at Def Jam at the time. But his resume is so like crazy in New York City because he was like, with Def Jam when Jay-Z and Dame Dash first started. So like, that's like his like trajectory. So he's like a part of that whole little crew of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, what the fuck? So I get a meeting with him. So I'm like, okay, go to this meeting with him. And I'm literally just talking to him like about things that I'm passionate about. And he like, mm, well, I mean, like, I need an assistant, but I don't know if you could really be my assistant, but maybe you could, like, do some free work and figure out what it is that you like. So that was, like, my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And, like, once all I needed was just, like, one opportunity. So Devon literally was, like, my foot in the door. And then from there, I was introduced and, like, to all of these other people who just literally helped elevate my career or like believed in my passion to give me a chance. So that's all it was about for me was like people like taking a chance on me and 
me fucking living up to whatever this chance was that they thought that I could actually do. Um, but what I will say is that I was able to sell, like, yo, let me tell you this. One thing about people is once people like you, like they can, they will almost do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Like getting people to like you is like the key to anything. And then like, I was selling myself just off of like, yo, I may not know anything about this world, but like my intellectual curiosity can like fill in any gap. And like my learning curve is going to be so quick. So I'm going to learn. So whatever. And that's how I was selling myself on people who like this fucking kid from Akron, Ohio. Who the fuck is she? She don't know nobody. She don't have no connects in New York City. But that was just like a little backstory of like how it happened for me. But from then, Devon ended up being just like a great mentor. So like throughout my whole career of fashion, he was just a great mentor and then in 2018 we reconnected and became partners so that's like a crazy story to go from like interning for somebody and now to be a co-founder of yeah, this company yeah. with them together no, that's um that's super, that's super powerful number one your network is your network that's so true <laughs> and number two you added value like you know what I'm saying? Yes. You, you can just ask people for something you were providing value for them first which you know that's a that's a win-win for both parties at that point absolutely you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying so that's 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 super powerful did you ever face any like did you ever face any backlash or just any hesitation from being a woman in, in, in your space in your industry all the time all the time like, all the time and still to this day like yeah. man it is so crazy i think like sexism was almost like a thing that I almost didn't think was real until I got here in New York City. Like, it is something that I deal with every single day. The male ego, <laughs> y'all are different. I'd be like, yo, is it that serious? Nobody, listen, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in healing. I'm, I'm, I'm in healing. So don't. <laughs> I mean, healing. <laughs> Thank God. But that male ego is something crazy, especially for like m men in power mm -hmm. or, yeah. Um, but what I will say, yes, I have faced a lot of like just struggle with being a woman and being a black woman. I remember when I first came on as partner, um, and it was like made very clear, like, for staff that from here on out like this is who you got to listen to and there were a lot of males on staff at the time when i first made that whole transition from fashion to full-time media mm -hmm. and they didn't like that i mean it was like a lot of dudes who would tell me like yo, i'm not listening to you like they would flat out look me in my eye and be like yo i'm not taking direction from you wow and i would be like yo what is this real oh, like, i gotta fire you now yeah. but um but yeah, like so, I have faced a lot of. Hey, so did you did you go ahead and fire, you went ahead and fired them too? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's yeah. so crazy because like Blue Magazine is a men's magazine, but like our staff is a lot of women, like mostly women. So that is just ugh, the male ego. It wasn't working. So that's yeah. just one thing. But yeah, Which I have faced a lot has of. It been, has it been? Um, a worse experience in, in fashion than it is in the entertainment or they kind of very, very similar no nah, fashion is like next level like craziness nah entertainment is like whatever it's cool like i take it on the chin fashion is like it'll fuck up your mental the entertainment industry is like it's not that deep but um yeah so what is what does the director of content of a of a magazine? What the hell does that mean? What 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 is that? Break break that down for me. Um. So basically, nothing goes into the magazine without me approving it. Um. All the cover stories, like anything that's on the cover, content that you see on social media, anything that you see on the website, like all of that has to be approved by me before it is post it before anything goes up um this whole strategy understanding like who our audience is and creating content specifically for our niche um what else like but it's different from the role of a startup so it's like we are a startup media company 
So everybody wears like multiple hats. So it's like, I think like a director of content, like at like a complex or something would be specific for content. But in my role for a startup and being a co-founder, it's like, I have multiple hats. So, but yeah, but that's like my main role is anything that you see content related, all any idea that has to do with content, it all comes from me. Um, Devon, he is the publisher. So like, he's like the money man. So like, he secures the ads, he gets the money, he gets the deals. But I'm solely like responsible for how this shit looks. Yeah. So yeah, basically. You also, do, you also do like your own like writing and stuff in there too, right? Am I? Am, am yeah, that's I, the other. Yeah, that's the other cool thing about like when you run a media company, you can kind of do whatever you want to do. So, and that was really the dope part also about like transitioning from fashion into media. So it's like I can appreciate fashion at a different level versus working in it. Um, but yeah, so like I write. I do like all type of shit, but yeah. Man, listen, I, I I really first off, thank you for sending me the the um the physical copies of the magazine. But like I yeah. I really enjoyed picking up a damn magazine in 2020 and reading. Yeah. Like that used to be a thing. Like coming up, like when I was a kid, my mom had the Ebony's, the Jets, the Oprah magazines. You know, she as I got older, I started getting the GQ magazines. Like magazines were a thing like physical yes. magazines like go to the barbershop the king magazines the double x sale the comp like oh, that was a real thing so like to sit down and read through magazines in 2020 like it fucked me up i'm like damn i haven't done this in so long um and i was just thinking i'm like yo like i really want to know like what kind of like made you want to go into the magazine and the publication space specifically especially like in this digital era that we in like what what was the thought process behind that and like um is is there any like like do you get any not not necessarily backlash but is it like would the rest of the industry say that it's even smart to put out physical publications in 2020 um no but if you can yes so here's the thing about a print magazine so like i feel like the reason why so many like publications like Condé Nast, which is Vogue, GQ. I only I only know what that is because I had another stylist on the on the podcast earlier this year, and she did some stuff with Condé Nast. So that's the only reason I know what the hell that is. That's the only. Reason <laughs> <I know. laughs> yes, but like, so like when you have like large, like media companies like Condé Nast. Um, what happens with those type of companies, like, and why they had to discontinue so many print publications, because print has died, but the reason is because, like, they couldn't fulfill budgets, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I gotta, like, cut something somewhere, so, like, budget cuts were, like, a whole reason why print media has died, so, like, advertising dollars weren't going towards, well, the amount of advertising dollars weren't really going towards print publications anymore, which cut down people wanting to print. But when you have like a niche brand like ours, like we're a niche brand, we print 150,000 copies, which sounds like a lot, but in actuality, it's not a lot compared to like all of these other brands. But literally the way that we survive is off of printing a magazine. Really? And because we have a distribution, so like our distribution is Barnes and Nobles and like barbershops on the East Coast. Really? So because we have a distribution and because we have a circulation, we are still able to get like also have a, a substantial amount of money for like advertising dollars. So like we got Lexus, we got Toyota, we got BMW, we have like fashion brands, but all of these people pay us still because we have this distribution. So I don't believe that like print is a dying thing. It's just that the media companies that people love didn't have the money to sustain the shit that they was doing in the past. So they had to like make sacrifices. But for us, it's like, we small, so we can still make it happen. And we so do. How has, how has COVID affected your business then from, from that standpoint? 
Okay, so I will say when COVID first hit in March, it was like really sketchy for us yeah. because Barnes and Nobles and all of our distribution locations were closed. Right. So all of our advertisers were now looking at us like, yo, like y'all distribution is like not the same anymore. So advertising dollar has to be cut. This was like in the beginning of COVID. Um, so that was like, oh my gosh. I think what it happened for us is like, it really woke up t- for us to take digital more serious. Because like the thing about like me and my team, like we are creatives and we just love like the physical copy. So like digital is like, uh, whatever. As long as like this, that something that something that somebody can like feel and touch and see is like beautiful, that was like our focus. But COVID made us really pay attention to like, damn, we do have to like capitalize in this digital space because it almost hindered like our whole fucking business moving forward. But luckily I want to say, like, in May or, like, June, like, Barnes & Noble started, like, opening back up. So our distribution wasn't affected that much. I think we had, like, a month where things were, like, shaky. But for the most part, it was cool. Now, the whole, like, working remote thing, that has been the number one thing, like, of just getting adjusted to. Because, like, first of all, we have fashion shoots, we have editorials that we got to shoot, like, all of these things where we got to engage and be on set and be with people. So just figuring out, like, how that works has been, like, a challenge. Working remotely, I thought working from home would be, like, fun, but yeah, I'd be like, yo, get me out of here. Yeah. I don't want to do another Zoom call. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, oh, my gosh. But you wholeheartedly i mean even even for me you know in the podcast like i was so um against doing zoom interviews like i'm just not i prefer you know being in the space and being able to sit right. down, like be able to really like exchange energy like i was not on it but you know i knew that listen i have to just pivot and adjust at the times and when i was reading your article um that you did with skip marley like that was one of the first things you had said. Now I would imagine that's when the pandemic had really just like jumped. Yeah. Off. You know what I'm saying? Cause you you was like, you know, we on this Zoom call and this is like weird. We waiting on to see if this Wi-Fi gonna connect. You right. Know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I could I, I I I could imagine that. But that's but I'm actually like, you know, um impressed to hear that like listen, these other publications are going away from the physical copies, but we still, you know, we still stand solid. Like that's, I, I enjoyed the magazine. Like it was, it's, it's very polished. It's clean. It looks great. Um, it's, it's modern. It, it don't look old. Like it's, it, it's nice. Like it was, yeah. it was high. Like the, the articles in there was good. It was a lot of good content. Like I was super, you know, impressed. And I'm like, damn, like this used, like again, for me, I was like, yo, this used to really be a thing, you know what I'm saying? So I, I enjoyed it for real. Yes, and that'd be my other thing also, because we are still such a small brand and we're like still growing and like making mistakes and learning. But my thing, like I always have to send somebody the magazine because I'm like, yo, once you see the mag, like you can't deny it. So yes, I'm glad you enjoyed it. The the magazine. What, what, what do you think? Because I, I know you said that you and your team, y'all prefer the physical copy. Like for me, when I got, when I looked at the magazine online, it don't give it the same, Mm-mm. it don't hit the same as the one. It that, doesn't at all. To, to me, um, that was just, that was just my opinion. So you, you feel, you feel the same way? Yes, I feel the exact same way. That's why I was like, yo, I got to send you mags. Let me send you some mags before, because like, again, like digital hasn't been something that we have given our all to like the actual print magazine is like where our attention has going to, but of course that's changing. Like we just like created a whole new website and all this other shit that's going on. But yes, I just feel like physical copies, digital is cool, but like, I like touching things. Like I like being able to like see something, hold it in my hands. Like, I just feel like that's way more substantial, but yeah. yeah. You know, I, I I I agree. Now, how how important is it for you to like be aware and conscious of like being a black owned magazine? Like, what brands you partner with? What you put in your magazine? Like, just overall, just conscious of the the content. And the reason I ask that question is because 
what 2020 has shown me is that like, number one, white folks have never been more scared from a corporation level than they are right now. Like everybody is looking at protecting their bottom dollar. Mm. And like when the George, George Floyd murder happened, you know, you started to see brands start to like make these public statements and things like that. And like, to me, from the outside looking in, it was looking like people were really just trying to save face. You know, a lot of people are tr trying to appear like they are doing something to affect mm -hmm. systemic change, but realistically, it's really just kind of like lip service. Um, so being a black owned company, like how, how aware, like how important is it for you to be um, conscious of like what you put in your magazine and like what brands you guys partner with, if at all? Um, no, it's very important to, it's very important that everything is like black. Mm -hmm. Like for us, from right. writers that we use to brands that we have people wear, like everything is very intentional for us, like to make it black. Like, like our thing is like black culture is American culture. Right. Um, right. So yeah and it's very intentional but even like on like touching back to what you said about like how suddenly now brands want to put like money towards black businesses or like that is honestly it's all a gimmick because if y'all weren't doing this prior to like y'all don't really care for real about black brands or black My anything um but yeah for us everything is just very intentional because I mean, like the space that we live in and and even like the narrative of like black men. So with Blue, I think our sole mission was to change the narrative of like black men in general. So like one thing that we really pride ourselves on are like catching images of just like black men smiling, right? So like, because I'm in boardrooms and conversations with like white execs and white people who have money to spend and they literally do not understand black people in any capacity. Partially clueless. Like so clueless. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't I personally don't believe like that they really care. Like they don't care for real. Like it's just where we're at right now. It's like I gotta act like I care. Right. The safe face. Yeah. Like it's about protecting that bottom dollar, man. Yeah, it's all about protecting the bottom dollar. Like Conde Nas, oh my gosh. Y'all talk so much shit about Conde Nas. Conde Nas was like one of the first people that I ever applied for an internship for, and they did not give me the internship. But it was funny because in 2018 they wanted to have a meeting with me to like pick my brain. So like this is what white people do. Yeah. I'm like, yo, wait, what? Yeah. yeah. But um, Conde Nast is really good at like capitalizing off of like events like this, and it makes me so upset when like black creatives celebrate publications like Conde Nast. Like, come on, like you can't be a black creative and celebrate a publication like Conde Nast that the first time they used a black photographer was when they shot Beyonce. Like, come on, so. I don't know. A lot of shit is happening now just for brands to, to save face. But yeah. I, I, I love, um, I, I did know that the um, the magazine was um, a magazine for, for men, but I didn't like, you know, I, lo I love to hear, you know, that y'all being intentional about doing s s subtle things that are like important. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Catching black men, that's so, so important. I hope that don't go over nobody's head. Like, Capturing black men candidly smiling like that is very much valuable, um, yeah. and that's not that's not that's not an intentional thing that's done in media, you know. Um, so that's 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 super, you know, um, important to hear you say that. Um, is there is there such thing like can a can an editorial in a magazine can they be independent? Is that is that a, is that a thing? Can you have a magazine that is independent outside of corporations and brands? Um, yeah, I think we're independent. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, like, dang, but not, hmm. Break it down. Not, 
okay never mind let me let me retract that statement because we not so much because i'm thinking about like what fuels us and our advertising dollars do come from large corporations yeah so i mean but no it's very possible i think there's a lot of like like it's a magazine called Crown Magazine, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of them, um, but I love Crown because they are solely independent. They don't have advertisers like we do. Like they literally produce off of like their own money. So some, some there are some who can like do it independently, but I just don't think that you could do it at the capacity that you're trying to reach, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the re and you know, part of the reason I asked that question is, you know, for me, <clears throat> build, building this podcast, like the podcast um, industry is becoming like a thing now. Um, yes. Or there are corporations, brands putting large budgets and like large dollars behind um, the podcast in the in the podcast industry, especially during COVID. So you're going to continue to see more celebrities have podcasts, more athletes have podcasts, more people who can leverage their celebrity for the greater good of the corporation and they're gonna keep putting money behind it. Um, and kind of like, and the, the beautiful thing about the podcast space is that it's really kind of like the wild west right now. There really aren't any real rules and there aren't really, there, there isn't a lot of real structure behind it. Um, now you have some people who will tell you, listen, I live and die through the ad dollars. You know, but for me, you know, being a new podcast um, and really trying to establish my independence, I'm finding other ways to monetize it outside of the ad space. Um, and so far, so good. It's been pretty lucrative. Like, you know, um, and I, I was just curious to know, like, you know, being a, I know you said you guys were a smaller magazine, so I was just kind of curious as, you know, what what your thought process w was, was on that. But it, I mean, you know, listen, Ain't nothing wrong with getting that money from from them brands. You you know what I'm saying? Ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that. Don't think don't think that y'all that diminishes the value at all because it because it does not. Not to me. Yeah. No. Um. But yeah. But speaking of like revenue, one of the like that's like a key thing for us is like always just thinking of what new ways to like build revenue that is that will eventually like. To where like anything that we get from an advertiser will be extra so like that is like the ultimate goal for us is to like literally disconnect from our advertisers because like yo honestly and truly like our advertisers give us hell like it's not like some walk in the park type shit like it's crazy so we're always trying to think of ways to like create new revenue so one thing that we recently just launched was like our merch site right which is shopbluelife.com um but it's crazy how like the merch has been selling so we're like really excited about that um but literally just trying to figure out new ways to like create revenue build revenue to really be like independent yeah. um anybody that's not of our color but yeah how do can you can you speak to that can you can you break that down like how do the um how can the advertisements the advertisement agencies and stuff kind of like get, give give you hell like is it that they look for when they say we're going to give you money to be placed in your magazine do they have a say so as far as like obviously they're going to have a say so like what their placement looks like yes but how just how specific and like how hands on are the advertising companies with what goes on in your your magazine, your editorial? Um, so thankfully they're not hands on to where like they can have a deciding factor on what goes into the magazine. Thank God for that. Um, but when I say like just difficult sometimes, trying to get so like so we have like a set rate for how much we ever however much we charge for an ad. Mm -hmm. um but getting people to like actually honor it because they don't understand the purpose of putting so much money into a black owned publication that's like the hell that we have to deal with like people just not understanding the whole value of it like why am i giving so much money to a black owned media company like mm -hmm. but yeah got you yeah and those would be the same companies that put out these advertisements that they are 
Black Lives Matter supporters and all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all fake. That's a that's a that's a that's a dirty that's a dirty game. It's a dirty game. That's that that's that's a very dirty game. One thing that I noticed in like reading through um the physical copies, like there was some like it seemed very intentional to me. Like there was some intentional conversations of like around mental health. Like obviously the G Herbo piece in there, mm-hmm. which which is super dope. Um he was he was actually the first one that I read, but there was some other um content and articles that I read that kind of touched on the mental health aspect of it. And and again, it seemed very intentional. Um has this has 2020 and just the pandemic has it kind of made you want to be more intentional about your overall mental health and dealing with everything that's kind of going on as well? Um yes, but I feel like it was prior to 2020. Right, right. Like I think the pandemic made people like sit still to really get their shit together, but as far as like mental health in general, um I think this has been something that has just been intentional for me for a long time. Like I had one of my cousins who I was really close with, he committed suicide. I want to say like a, three years ago. And it was just so like, I could not understand because he appeared to be so happy. So it was like everything, mental health and just like, knowing that you could talk to somebody or creating spaces of like comfortability to where like you know you're not going to be judged Mm -hmm. or you know like you can tell somebody something and they're not going to use it against you and just creating spaces that people feel free to talk about issues that they're dealing with so like mental health has always just been something that is super important to me and it's like prior way before the pandemic ever kicked off Hmm? so you go to therapy yourself i listen i used to be in therapy i'm not in therapy anymore like i need to find a new therapist because my therapist was wilding (laughs) but um (laughs) yo i used to go to therapy like yo sis am i helping you or you supposed to be helping me like what what were you doing here but um (laughs) But yeah, no, I so like, but it's something that I absolutely encourage because it's just like no judgment to be able to talk to somebody and not be judged. I think that's like one thing that I always struggle with in life. I be dealing with some real fucking shit like sometimes, but I always feel like, yo, I can't talk to nobody because people already have like this expectancy of what of what my life is. So if I come to you with my problem, I know that you're going to talk to it about somebody else and it's just going to be a whole other situation. So having somebody that you can like confide in safely and know that they ain't going to like run their mouth about your business is so important. So I definitely champion therapy. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm with you. Like I, like I told you before we started, listen, I had therapy today. I've been going regularly for the last few years. Um, I encourage everybody, especially black people, just I encourage everybody to go. Um, yeah. I also encourage the dude, what you just said, listen, take your time of finding you a good provider too. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Listen, if you got to get the right one, it's nothing it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not wrong with that, you know, but I think it's very important to be intentional about your health, especially for entrepreneurs. Like, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot that comes with this shit. Like, don't don't get it twisted. Like, this is not all glitz and glamour. This is not, not all just counting your own money. And you, nobody can tell you what to do. You get to wake up whenever you want. There's no. a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, a lot of misconceptions. And and, and, it, and it comes with a lot of, like, you know, um, isolation, you know, because a lot of times people don't understand it. Mm-mm. They don't understand it at all. But it definitely comes with a lot of isolation, a lot of risk, a Mm -hmm. lot of separation. Uh, Like I compare it to being an entrepreneur, like I always compare it to like climbing a mountain. And I don't know if you've ever like really climbed a mountain, but like the closer you get to the top, the harder it becomes for you to breathe. So it's like, that is like the same thing with entrepreneur, the closer you get to like almost making it, the hard, like, it is like suffering. Being an entrepreneur is like such a bold move because it's like intentional suffering that you're putting upon your life. Because it's like, it is not glamorous at all. It's a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of like sad days, but sticking to it 
the reward is like so great like the reward is so great but you go through so many feelings so many highs so many lows so many like questioning yourself like damn should I really be doing this but yeah it's literally self-inflicted suffering that's what I call entrepreneurship Mm, that is so that is so eloquently spoken. That's so good. That, that's so good. I hope I hope people, you know what I'm saying, really, really take it. Take it. That, that is that is very powerful. Um and, and, and very good. Tell me some of the, the misconceptions about running a business and running your business specifically. Um misconceptions about running a business. Yeah. Like what are misconceptions? I think like what would be some misconceptions that people would have about running a business? Uh I think like freedom, maybe like the idea, like I'm gonna run my business so I can have like some sort of like freedom. Cause that's not, that's not the case at all. Like I'm, I can't even like turn my phone off if I wanted to, mm. like, because I'll miss something. Mm. Um, what else are like misconceptions becoming like rich? You think you're going to run a business or like be an entrepreneur and then suddenly you're just going to be wealthy. Like that is, the biggest misconception because that's not the case at all um what else are like misconceptions y'all i think it's so many misconceptions that come with running a business like but those two that i just mentioned probably like the main two thinking that you're just gonna be rich and thinking that you're gonna suddenly have like this free life when like That's not the case. If you get to a point where your business is actually able to sustain itself, like this is, you got to work harder than you've ever worked in your life. Like you, if you think working hard up until the point to get to sustaining your business was hard, you got to work harder, faster. Everything is like multiplied once you get to like that level. Like, okay, I have an established business. So yeah tell me tell me tell me five things that you think every entrepreneur should should do like some five foundational things or just five values or principles that every entrepreneur should kind of like abide by um five things okay number one i want to start with like your environment uh i think everybody has like an inner voice or like something inside of them that is telling them to go for something. Um, but your environment, whatever space you in can silence that to where you don't even hear it no more. So like, I feel like everybody is literally born with something in them. But if you're in an environment that's not like pouring into it or encouraging it, or like telling you that you're extraordinary, then like you'll never live up to that because nobody around you is telling you that. So like your environment is, so important and it's such a redundant thing but it's like show me your friends and i'll show you your future period is that why you left Akron? oh absolutely <laughs> it's absolutely and i'll i never like to have like a negative conversation about Akron, but it's absolutely why i left Akron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm here i get it yeah <laughs> i get it for sure so environment number one number two entrepreneurs a tip for entrepreneurs or like key things for entrepreneurs um like you have to be mindful of who you tell your dreams to like i advise people to whoever it is whether it's like best friend mom dad wife husband whoever it is like I advise you to not share your dreams with people with anybody that's going to try to hold you back so that's just like number two um number three what else like I would say just circling back to what I said originally and like being an entrepreneur is not like appealing it's not like this romantic like how you said it's like romanticized like the reality of entrepreneurship accepting the reality of what it means 
to be an entrepreneur and like it's a heavy burden but like just still sticking with it and never quitting like people talk about like don't quit but you can never quit on when you know that you are set to be an entrepreneur um what else what else what else what else how many did i give you how many was that that was three dang i need two more two more two more okay let me think let me think let me think um or they can just or they can just be principles like you know they can just be a principle or a value to live by okay um okay so this is the one thing enjoying like enjoying like the in between so i've seen this thing that nas talked talked about with like how so many people nowadays are like instant gratification I need to be like successful immediately and not enjoying like the time that it took you to get to your success so like literally enjoying that in between time from like having a dream like putting yourself on a path to fulfill your vision and like the end result but just literally enjoying and not being in a rush to like have success because anything worth having of course like takes a lot of time um and just not being scared or feeling defeated because it gets hard like just keep going pain means the body is still working so no matter how painful the journey becomes like just keep going like that is like the best advice that i could give that, that, that's that's powerful um kobe kobe bryant said <clears throat> one time he said that uh a lot of times people attribute the dream of success is like the end goal so like winning mvps winning championships but really the dream is like the journey and the process it's the going to the gym at three in the morning when nobody watching you know what i'm saying it's the preparation for a podcast episode it is Bouncing your ideas off, you know what I'm saying, with your team before you go ahead and figure out what you're going to put in your next magazine. It's the things that people don't see. Yeah. That's the, that's the, the beauty of it. <laughs> you, 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 you know what I'm saying? So I think, you know, that's, 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 very, that's very, very, very valuable. Listen, I want to I ask you this. When you were experiencing just like some of your own internal battles, when you was like trying to figure out your transition from fashion into the media in the entertainment space like what were your people back home saying like were they trying to get you to come back home were they encouraging you was it like a was it something that you just kind of kept to yourself like like what was what was what was that what, what was that process oh i definitely it was definitely something that i kept to myself right so nobody really knew yeah nobody knew like yeah nobody was aware because i knew like once i made people aware like yo outside influences are like heavier than like what you could even imagine like with me like i'm so like low-key and like kind of just don't like to tell people anything that i have going on just simply because i just want to make a decision on my own without being influenced by something that anybody has to say so when i was making that whole transition like i didn't tell anybody because i just knew so many people wouldn't understand it but i understood it and i was also aware that like no matter what like people this is the number one thing people like do suicide to themselves and they put like an expiration date on their evolution so for me like it's no expiration date on my personal evolution. Like I'm never gonna think like I'm too old or I'm too this or I'm too something to achieve anything. But people put that on themselves and that's their own personal thing. So when I was going through my shit, I just had to like keep it to myself because I knew everybody around me would not understand it. So, so yeah. Yeah, no, so, so it sounded like it worked out though. You know? Yeah, it did. It worked out like for the best. 
that's teeters on the lines of like extreme confidence and like just being a little bit of like naive to a, like to a good to, for for a good reason to me like you know what I'm saying like it's good to have that much confidence in yourself it's like you know what I'm gonna just hold it in and keep it moving and it's just like look whatever happens I'm gonna live with the results you know yeah. So I, I I I I respect that you know um, wholeheartedly. Nah, for sure. But almost listen because I'm so humble. I don't even like to call it confidence. I just like to say like having faith in faith. Like that's what it was for me. Like no matter how dark situations may get for me, like I always have faith in faith. And because of that, like, it's always something positive that ends up being on the other side. Yeah. So, and I'll just be like, yo, God ain't going to do me like this. So. That's, 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 that's very true. But don't, don't diminish your light. Listen, you put in a lot of work for what you got. You know what I'm saying? So listen. No, that is true. That is. That. Sometimes as black folks, man, we like to, you know, downplay what, what we didn't did, you know, and, and downplay, you know, our, our true value, man. What you have done, you have built something amazing like you know what I'm saying you had plenty of reasons to say I'm done with this like you know you have reasons to quit you know so it's 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 okay to walk to walk in that confidence too you know what I'm saying so that's 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 good too that, that that's that's very good in itself also no that is very true and it's so funny because my mentor he always tells me that I do this thing to where like I hide behind humble hiding behind humble mm -hmm. like to where I will downplay the shit out of anything that I've done because I'd be feeling like y'all don't want nobody to like feel like I'm trying to brag or like I'm trying to shit on them with my accomplishments and like that's where I have lived in my mind for so long to where like I was doing like even recently like I just wrapped up a campaign uh with like a brand that I love I can't really talk about it because of like NDAs and all this other shit but it's a brand that I love I mentioned the person's name earlier <laughs> all right, all right. so, <laughs> so all right. like like even things like that but I won't talk about it to people because I'm always like y'all I don't want nobody to like feel some type of way about anything that I have going on so that is one thing that I struggle with is hiding behind humble and like not even owning my accomplishment or like dealing with like imposter syndrome like damn me like, you know, I'm from Akron, Ohio. Like, so, but no. Nah. The other night, go ahead. You got, you got to talk sometime. <laughs> no, that's true. Got, For real. Time. And, I, and I do believe, like, that's a, you know, that is a um, a symptom of racism. I, I think, you know, the impact of racism has um, impacted us psychologically to where, you know, we have a hard time of really um walking and knowing our true value like yes. you know like there's a there's a fine line between being aware and like knowing your worth and bragging like you, you know what i'm saying because for real for real your work gonna do the talking you know but it's, it's hard to say listen i did that shit and yes. i'm standing on that you know what i'm saying it, it's, it's all good so we gonna continue to empower you and ask you to keep, keep walking in that light don't diminish that don't hide behind humble <laughs> Oh, I would try my best not to. Right, right, right. Well, listen, listen. This has been a wonder, wonderful conversation. Um, I, I thank you so much. You know what I'm saying for coming thank on here. Thank you for having this, me. This has been great. Um, before before you get get out of here, I got a few you know rapid questions that I want to ask you. Um, okay. before I even get into that, like, just talk to me about your overall, um future outlook on on blue the magazine your company like what what is your what is your 10-year goal like what is your vision board looking like for, for for ebony like what 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 is it looking like for you this is so funny i wish i could like flip my camera to show you my wall <laughs> but anyway um honestly like the end goal for me is like for for blue to be the largest black owned media company in the world Mm -hmm. um, and that's like the vision that I have for the brand and I see it happening it's so crazy because like I see it happening and I know that it's going to happen like 
the like my emails and the people that reach out to me I just know that we are on that path so like that's like the end goal for for blue but as far as like my personal self um like outside of the magazine like my end goal is to so of course like I want to like write really great fiction novels um so and this is crazy because like it's a book that I have been working on for a really long time um and I just got an agent for it so I'm excited because it'll come out in 2021 so I'm very excited about that um but like outside of being an author I have another like I have another whole other like side project baby that's about to come out right before Christmas that I'm very excited. I can't really talk too much about that either. You'll see it. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah. So go for blue, create to be the largest media company in the world and have it be black owned and like the decisions are being made by black people. But yeah. That's dope. That's dope. Do you think that every do you think that <clears throat> everybody is a creator? Um, no, I don't. Well, you know what? Okay, be honest, hmm. be honest, and it, like to but to what like extent? Like, to what extent? I feel like everybody has nah, everybody's not a creator. Everybody's not a creator. That's just the reality of it. Everybody is not a creator, just like everybody isn't a doctor, just like everybody isn't a lawyer. Um, but yeah, so no, I don't think everybody is. You gotta go to school for though. Wait, hold on, hold on. I ain't catch the first part. I said those. I said those are things that you have to go to school for. That is true. You do have to go to school to be a lawyer or a doctor. Um, I'll tell you, let me ask, let me tell you the reason why why I asked that question. Um, I've gotten a couple of different answers from people on the podcast about that. You know, I've had some people say what you just said, like, nah, everybody just don't have it. I I think that there is levels to it. I think that some people have certain gifts that are just like God given that everybody don't got. Yeah, like you know I'm saying like, um. I didn't even realize until I became an adult, you know, my mother's creative side. Like she had a, she had a thing with being able to see things a certain way and be able to put them together. Like that was a gift. Like she took pride in the way she dressed. Like she was fly. Like that was what, what it was. Like it came natural to her. Um, and I think certain people have certain gifts a little bit more, you know, intense, intense to others. But I do think that, everybody has something within them to be able to start build and like fulfill something i I do believe that everybody has that um but i just i just think it's levels to it honestly yeah um hmm. you don't think so no i don't i think some people are intended like to help somebody Mm -hmm. like I think literally some people's purpose are literally to help somebody build something. Granted, that wasn't my purpose, but there are people who's like purpose. Cause it's like people on your, like you need a team. Like everybody needs a team and everybody on the team is not going to be the creator, but they can help you get to like a, a, a level. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't believe that everybody is a creator but i feel like everybody definitely has a gift and something to offer to the world okay, okay. I, I i can respect that i i, I can take that I, I, yeah. I can take that um what are your what are your intentions to end 2020 uh my intentions to end 2020 yeah. like like how do you want the how do you want the year to end for you uh how do i want the year to end for me okay uh, happy i want to be happy of <laughs> course happiness is key um how do i want the year to end what is, what is happiness for you um happiness for me is like i find happiness in knowing that my family is okay 
So like, it's a lot of people in my family that depend on me now. Mm-hmm. So like, I talked a little bit earlier, like about my mom's situation but like my mom depends on me now so like my mom has a really cozy life now and that's like on my behalf and it's not something that like and I'm like okay with that like that makes me feel good to know like dang I can like take care of people in my family Mm -hmm. so 2020 I just pray that you know like God continues to bless me and continues to pour an abundance in my life so I can pour an abundance into other people's lives so yeah that's that's, that's good what is your what is your purpose and how does that connect to what you're doing on a day-to-day um with blue purpose um okay so I feel like my purpose uh outside of myself is to create to make it easier for everybody that comes like uh behind me i talked earlier about like how i never had a silver spoon people look at my life and there's like this assumption that maybe there was a silver spoon but it's like no i'm the silver spoon so it's like everybody who will come after me like my niece i think about my niece a lot because like i don't have children yet but my niece is so close to me and the opportunities that she is able to have or things that she's able to do because of like sacrifices that I had to make, that is like amazing. So purpose, my purpose, I just solely feel like is to anybody that comes after me moving forward will, it it just won't be as hard. So like, I understand that my life is like a sacrifice for everybody else. Who, who will come behind me. So I just feel like that's my purpose. Go, go, go. What is something about you people will be surprised to know? Something about me that people will be surprised to know. Um, damn. I mean, minus the fact that I'm like shy as fuck. I think people are always shocked when I tell them like, yo, I'm shy. For real? Uh, I'm very shy. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, I'm like so shy. I wish people could like hear my thoughts so they could like <laughs> understand how shy I am. Um, but what is? Uh, hold on. Outside of that, though, like what is something about me that people don't know? I don't know. Honestly, I think I'm gonna just I'm gonna just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. What um what scares you? What scares me? Hmm. Dang, what scares me? What scares me? Um, Damn, that's crazy. Cause like, it's only one word that keeps like popping up in my head, but I don't even want to say that because it's like, it's the most inevitable thing in life. But, no it's not even failure but I don't think it's failure I think it's like not living up to my fullest potential I think that's what scares me like not using or utilizing all the gifts that God gives me so yeah Yeah, I I, I resonate with that wholeheartedly so I I I, I feel you on that um what is what's your favorite quote my favorite quote um, I have favorite Bible verse. It don't. It don't matter. I have a like a couple of like favorite quotes. One of my favorite quotes is I don't know who said this, but I remember seeing it when I was young, and I always carried it with me. But it was like it's like a quote like, "It's the children that the world almost breaks that go on to save it." That's one of my favorite quotes. And another one of my favorite quotes is, um, I stand on the sacrifices of a million women before me thinking, what can I do to make this mountain taller so the women after me can see further? So, yeah, Yeah, I know that was a little long, but that's like one of my favorite ones because it's just like so real for me in my life. But, um, but yeah. Okay, that's good. What is the best advice you ever received? The best advice that I ever received, um, I 
the best advice that I ever received. Hmm. I've received a lot of good advice in my lifetime. Um, I'm trying to think about like the best advice though. Damn. Uh, okay, honestly, this is one, and it always sticks out with me. It always sticks out to me, not with me, but to me. Um, manifestation. So, like, people talk a lot about, like, this word manifestation, right? To where now people just believe, like, yo, if I sit down and think about something, it's gonna happen. And it's like, mm, no. So the best advice, and like at one point in time, I was like, I was that person. I was like, yeah, I manifested this in my life. Um, but one of my mentors told me like, yo, don't give that much credit to like manifestation. Like manifestation is powerful, but like the power of hard work trumps the power of thoughts any day. That's a fact. So that i think that's like some of the best advice i've ever received yeah, that, 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 that's a fact i mean desires mean nothing without the action behind it yeah you know for I'm sure they go hand in hand, but the, the action is is everything you know what i'm saying that's 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 much more harder yeah if you could if you could pick up the phone and call your 20 year old self what would you tell yourself knowing what you know today if I could pick up the phone and call 20-year-old Ev, what would I say? I'd be like, girl. <laughs> um, what would I say? Honestly and truly, I would like be like, yo, keep doing what you're doing. Because one thing about me, I've always been a focused like woman. Like distractions may have come into my life but like I've always been able to like I've always had discernment I've always been focused on like whatever my goal is so if I could call a 20 year old Ib, I would say keep doing what you're doing stay the course and don't be discouraged wonderful wonderful well listen Eb, Ebony, man I appreciate you so much for coming on here this is this has been wonderful um I know people are gonna get a whole lot of value a whole lot of game from this, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm really looking forward to what you got coming up. Um, I'm really looking forward to this book that you got coming up. Hopefully, when it, when it comes out next year, maybe we can bring you back on and you know we get we can talk a little bit about the book. So that that that's really that's really cool. You doing your thing. I, I wish you much much success. You know, much health and wealth. Um, and you know, and, and, and more and more blessings for you. And don't hide behind humble. You know? <laughs> I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> That's all, that's all right. That's 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 all right. That, that that's that's more that's more than cool. But listen, tell me tell me everything you got coming up. Tell me your social media tags so people can get in contact with you. Tell them the um the website. I know you said the merch was 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 popping right now. So tell me where they can go grab that. Um yeah, tell me what, what you know what the what to look forward to. Um, so I have my jewelry line dropping in December. It's called Gold Lily. I'm so excited about it. It's crazy because like everything that I have on right now is like from my jewelry line, but I can't wait to release it in December. Um so that's something that I'm really excited about. Blue magazine. December what? Uh it's it's gonna be before Christmas. Okay. All right. Don't have like a but it'll be before Christmas for sure. Okay. All right. Um Blue Mag, bluemag.com. Check us out. Instagram, Blue Magazine, Bombshell, Bombshell by Blue.com. Instagram, Bombshell by Blue. Um, my personal Instagram is Ebony Alea. Um, what else? That's it. That's, that's it. it. That's it. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much. The one I got one, I got one last thing to ask for you. Um, one thing that I always have my guests do. I am a I'm a podcast junkie. Like I consume a lot of podcasts. I'm very much informed by podcasts to this day. Um, and like one of my inspirations was starting this podcast. It was a guy named Arian Foster, or a guy named Arian Foster. He is a um, a former NFL uh, running back. He used to play for the Houston Texans, the Miami Dolphins. He does a lot of things creatively now with like music. He has a podcast himself. And he also like he actually took a step away from the podcast for a minute. Um, and he's back doing like some creating content stuff where he's having like these super informed discussions with like, it's, it's actually like super, it's genius for real. It's crazy. He's having like conversations with like 
these right wing conservatives and like breaking down like what systemic racism is. It's crazy. He killing them. But it's it's like very it's very you know um, good content. But one thing that he would do on his podcast is he would have his guests lobby for Jim Carrey to come on his show. Jim Carrey was like one of his most famous you know coolest people he ever he wanted to you know interact with or whatever. So you know just a way to like show a homage to him um, and know who come before me in the podcast space. I asked my guests to look in their camera and tell Arian Foster why he needs to come on the Live Your Purpose podcast. We gonna we gonna manifest it, but we are gonna put that hard work in to get him on here too. You feel me? So if you could look in your camera and tell Mr. Arian Foster why he should come on the Leah Purpose podcast. Okay. Um. Okay. Wait. 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 Before we do this. Uh huh. Before we, before we do this. Uh huh. Can you give me like a little more of his story, real okay. quick? Again. Yeah. Okay. So all right. Good. I will. So again, he's a former NFL player. Um, when he was in the league, he made like, he was one of the early ones who was like kneeling with Cap Kaepernick pretty early. He was very outspoken before becoming an outspoken player. It was kind of like a thing. Um, he was like, say, he would say like just these, um, very intellectual statements that like people in the system would not want him to say, like he's an atheist. He would just say a whole lot of shit that people would not want him to say. But he's also very creative. Like I said, he does music, he does rap, um, he does a lot of things creatively, um, a lot of things with content creation now, where he's having a lot of intellectual and building conversations um, to ultimately help educate people on the importance of politics and educate the people the importance of just like systemic racism, the importance of financial literacy. He's doing a lot of community work. Um, but ultimately, like, dude is like very intellectually savvy and just like very genuine um it's not like super buttoned up suit and tie type you know square shit it's very genuine um so hopefully that was a good enough rundown and breakdown of you know uh, of who he is yeah because i'm like wait okay i need to hear who he is oh no, no, that's cool that's cool um okay arian foster foster okay yep, yep. I need to tell Arian why he need to come on your podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and action. Arian, yo, my guy, you have to come on John's podcast. First of all, it's called Live Your Purpose. Your whole life has been about living in your purpose. So I feel like you have so much insight so many gems that you can share with his audience that they can take away from that can leave so many people inspired motivated fueled so like you know come water the garden come bless us and uh drop some gems baby hey Wait. hey, hey. Let's, let's <laughs> what else? What else? you know we go we go we gonna leave it right there listen appreciate you again ebony this has been this has been wonderful um, again, please subscribe to the Live Your Purpose podcast the YouTube channel. Check us out on all your audio platforms. Um, check in and tap in with us about the merch. Um, it is available, so hit hit us up. I mean, I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna get you some of that too. Um, and yeah, check out Blue Mag, man. It's 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 it's, it's a wonderful editorial, man. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing Ebony continue to blossom and continue to grow. So, thank you again for coming on. This has been a wonderful episode. Another episode in the Books Live Purpose podcast. We out. Thank you for, ha you Thank you for having me, John.